How do you tell if someone is a member of a gym? The number one reason is if they can move the pulpit without being winded. <laughs> being winded at right before they're about to speak their message. Let me just rest for a minute. <laughs> How do you tell? How do you tell someone is a member of a gym? Call it out. What do you think? Big muscles. Big muscles. Okay, yeah, big muscles. <laughs> They'll tell you. Yeah, <laughs> that's number one. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? They're flexible. Yeah. What about what they wear? Gym outfits. Athletic apparel. Don't Google that. I learned that the hard way. <laughs> um, anything else? What do you think? What about the, what their gear? Like what they're holding? What does a person who go to the gym usually have in their hand? A water bottle. Yeah, maybe they got one of those, like, their iPhone, like, on a strap. Or, do they still do that? That's still a thing. A strap on their... It's not. It's not a thing anymore. Was it, Okay, I'm out of it. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Maybe they've got their yoga mat under their arm. Maybe they've got one of those... Have you seen those blender bottles? You know, they're for like mixing up the protein drinks. And then if they're really hardcore, they're just drinking water out of it. But they have the little metal thing in there still. Just to show everyone, when I'm not drinking water, it's a blend. Like, it, I'm drinking protein because I'm ripped, right? <laughs> I'm not making fun. I'm not, I promise. <laughs> yeah, so usually what I've found is that when someone is a member of a gym, like, it's usually pretty obvious. <laughs> it's usually pretty obvious. Like, it's a dead giveaway. All the things they're wearing, the things they're holding, um, how they look physically, they're dead giveaways about their appearance and what they're doing that shows they are a member of a gym. So now I have another question for you. How do you tell if someone is a member of a church? They have a fish on their car. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Doug. They have a fish on their car. Hopefully it's not... I've seen a couple of fishes. There's like the, the real fish, and then there's the Darwin eating a fish that's like super passive-aggressive. And then, and then the Christians just went straight aggressive and had like another Jesus fish eating the Darwin fish again. So it's like three fish, and I'm just waiting for like more... Like how, how far will this go? You know? How far will this go? So they have a Jesus, they have a Jesus, um, uh, a Jesus fish bumper sticker... How else can you tell if someone is a Christian, is a member of a church? They're holding a Bible. There you go. They're reading the Bible. They have one. Anything. What about the way they dress on Sunday morning? Some, they dress, their, car's in, their car isn't in the driveway on Sunday. Yeah. That's how a burglar tells if someone is a Christian. <laughs> uh, maybe it's um, the way they act. Maybe they're kind. They're generous. Maybe they give their money to the poor, to the homeless. Maybe it is how they dress on Sunday. Maybe they dress in their Sunday best, which, you know, it differs in the, the part of the nation you're in. If you go to, like, a southern black church, like, they're dressed nice. Like, they're in full suits and ties and dresses and stuff. And here, here, you know, I, this, is, this is my Sunday best. <laughs> Sweater, jeans, I'm wearing nice shoes. A little bit of a different level, but on, if you see me on the weekday, I'm in like a hoodie. So this is Sunday. This is my Sunday best. <laughs> uh, Sunday best. Maybe they're carrying their Bible. Maybe it's what they're not doing. You can tell someone's a member of a church because of what they're not doing. They're not drinking alcohol. They're not doing drugs. They're not going to like big parties. They're not having premarital sex. Maybe that's the way you tell if someone is a Christian. But here's the thing. A Muslim can be kind. A Muslim can be generous. A Hindu can dress very nice on Sunday morning. A Buddhist can avoid alcohol. And an atheist can read their Bible. In fact, a lot of them read it more than we do. So what sets us apart? What sets us, sets us apart as the church? When an outsider looks into your life, what do they see that reveals who you are and the movement that you are a part of? Who you are as a Christian and the movement you're a part of, the church, the way, God's church, God's people, the body of Christ. What is your dead giveaway? What is your dead giveaway? We're starting a sermon series today called We Are the Church. 
And I love this because it is a celebration of this amazing movement, this amazing organization called God's church, called the church, and why it's so important that we need to be a part of it. We need to be invested in it. We need to be moving forward in unity as the church. But before we get really like into this series, I wanted to just start off with a question. I wanted to start about that, when ask that question, how do unbelievers even know we're the church? How will they know? So please turn in your Bibles to John chapter 13, verse 34, and I'm going to give you a real quick answer. It's laid out so easily for us. John 13, verse 34. So this is on the night Jesus was betrayed. This is Jesus' last night on earth, right? He's having, he's having dinner with his disciples. And in the midst of the meal, he turns to them and says, verse 34, So now I am giving you, his disciples, a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. And when it says love each other, it's saying disciples, love your other disciples. Churchgoers, love your other churchgoers. It is pointing us as believers to love the person who is sitting in the row across from you, who is sitting in the row in front of you and behind you. And verse 35 is such an important verse. And this is the whole crux of my entire message. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. The way that you love one another will prove to the world that you are my church. And I think that is so interesting because it's not the way you love the world. It's not giving to the homeless. It's not um, singing songs and inviting people to church. It's not even sharing the gospel. All those things are amazing, and we should be doing those, right? But the thing that sets us apart and proves that we are the church is how we treat each other. It's how we treat each other. Your fellow Christians, your brothers, and your sisters, because that's what we're called to be. We're a family and we are brothers and sisters. The love we show each other reveals Christ's love for the world. It's like when people look into our lives and see the way that we treat each other, the way that we're loving, the way that we're caring, the way that we're calling each other, the way that we're visiting each other, the way that we're holding each other accountable, when the world looks in on us and sees that, sees brothers and sisters living in harmony, living in love, they say, I want that. I want that kind of relationship. I want that kind of family. I want that kind of love in my life. They want to be pulled out of the dysfunction of the world and brought into the devotion of the church. That is what's so appealing about the church. And when the church is not acting in that way, when the church is not acting in love, the world looks at it and says, well, that's just as dysfunctional as the world I came from. Who wants to join a dysfunctional family? No one. I came from a dysfunctional, not me personally, but you know, I I came from a dysfunctional family. I I don't want another one. I want something better. The world is looking for love. The world is looking for something greater to be a part of. Let's show them what it is. Let's show them what it is. Show Christ's love for them. Show Jesus' love for them by loving each other. Well, how do we do that? You know, there had to be a how do we do that? How do we do that? And I went all around this for a long time about how to demonstrate to you and share with you what you need to do and what I need to do as a Christian in order to love my brother. And I could have made you a list, right? We have 10 points, 10 points to this message. Love them by doing this, love them by doing this, love them by doing this. But you know what I realized as I was doing that? You already know. I already know how to love you. You already know how to love me. The issue sometimes is our willingness to actually do it. 
we all know already how to love, how to give someone a call when they're struggling, how to pray for someone, how to visit them in the hospital, how to feed someone who's hungry. We know how to do that. We just got to go do it. And I could end my message right there. Just do it. But instead, I got about 50 minutes worth of content left. <laughs> I'm, I'm teasing. <laughs> uh, I, I, I wanted to show you an example. Instead of giving you a list, I want to show you an example of true brotherly love. What does it mean to love someone who is not biologically your brother, not biologically your sister, but to bring them into your family and love them with an everlasting love that breaks all boundaries, nationality and culture and language and skin color? Because that's what the church is all about, right? So turn your Bibles, please, to 1 Samuel Chapter 18. We're going Old Testament today. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 1. So this is the story of King David. And this takes place right after David defeats the giant, Goliath. So David has just been victorious. He's just killed this giant with a sling and a stone. And King Saul approach, you know, runs up to David like, oh my, you miracle man. Like, what have you done? You know, like, this is a, you've just done something tremendous. He's congratulating him. It's amazing. David's feeling good. He's like, I don't have to pay taxes anymore. Great. That's what it says in the story. <laughs> he doesn't have to pay taxes because he killed the giant. Oh, man. Even back then, we were, we were concerned about it. So chapter 18, verse 1, it says, After David had finished talking with Saul, Saul is just lighting him up. I am so pleased with you, young man. You just saved hundreds of soldiers' lives by killing one man. After David had finished talking to Saul, David met Jonathan, the king's son. And there was an immediate bond between them, for Jonathan loved David. And the, the actual Hebrew words, the, the original language for this, it says the soul of Jonathan was knitted together with David. They were brothers. They loved each other with a brotherly love, a brotherly tenderness, a brotherly affection. And it pains me that I have to make a justification here, but I need to because of our current cultural context. This love was pure. This love between one man and another man was what God intended. This is not homosexual lust, which God is very clear about that being not okay, that, that being sinful. This is one brother loving another brother, being tender with him, being intimate with him, but not sexual. And the fact that I have to make that justification makes me so sad because to me, it proves that we have lost something as a society and as a church because we are so afraid of being called homosexual, being called gay. We're so afraid. We want to avoid any semblance of that, that we avoid brotherly love, that we avoid sisterly affection. There used to be this thing, you know, you go watch, go watch Little House in a, on the Prairie. That was, that was even 100 years ago, right? You'd see girls, they're just holding hands, walking down the street. They loved each other. They were friends. It wasn't sexual. But the world has so twisted that kind of bosom buddy love, you know, that it becomes like, well, you must be gay. No. This is the love between sisters. This is the love between brothers. And it is something that is beautiful and is something that will last when we get to heaven. There won't be any giving or taking of, in marriage in heaven. Jesus says that. But we will have brothers and we will have sisters and we will be able to share with them the kind of love and tenderness and hope and joy for eternity. And I'm so looking forward to being freed from the shackles of this society. Amen? And as I say that, you know, sometimes we choose to be shackled to it. Why don't we just show that kind of brotherly love to each other now? Not being afraid of what the world thinks. 
because that kind of sisterly love now. Because when we do that, I guarantee the world will take notice. They love each other. So that's what true love is. That's what love between a man and a man really is. A love between a woman and a woman. It's not, it doesn't have to be sexual. I can do that. Maybe if we teach that to the world, we'd solve the problem. Men would be able to experience true, true godly love with other men like they're supposed to. Removing sexuality from it. And the same for women. Maybe men and women who struggle with homosexuality would actually be able to fulfill the longing of their hearts because they're able to experience intimacy and tenderness with those of the same sex without feeling like, this must be sexual, this must be my sexual urge. I don't know. And none of that was in my sermon. But you know what? I think we need to talk about it. And I think we need to love each other Amen? Amen. Their souls were knitted together. Oh, I love that. Verse 2, from that day on, Saul kept David with him and wouldn't let him return home. <laughs> oh, man, we can't do that nowadays. <laughs> uh, this was an honor, okay? This was King Saul inviting a person into his home to basically become a prince. <laughs> but yeah, maybe call their parents before you do that. <laughs> Saul kept David and wouldn't let him return home. Verse 3, and Jonathan made a solemn pact with David because he loved him as he loved himself. Jonathan sealed this pact by taking off his royal robe, taking off his royal garment, and giving it to David, together with his sword, his bow, and his belt. And in this moment, Jonathan showed just tremendous love for David. Agape love. Everlasting love. And I think it is such a profound example that we and the church can look to. We can look at this love between David. We can look at this love between Jonathan, and we can learn from it. We can learn from it. So how did Jonathan love David? How did he demonstrate that true brotherly love that we so desperately need in our church today and the world is so desperately looking for in the outside? Number one, Jonathan loved David by adopting him into his family. You see, that action of taking off his royal robe, taking off his royal tunic, taking off his belt, giving him his sword, his bow, and, and, and his belt, that was an act. And laying them at David's feet, it was an act of adoption. He said, you are a shepherd boy no longer. From today on, you are a prince, and you will dress as such, and you will wear the weapons of war that were crafted just for me. If you look in 1 Samuel chapter 13, it says there were no blacksmiths in all of Israel it, because the Philistines were afraid of them making swords. Philistines, the enemies. And so whenever they wanted to have a plow or a hoe sharpened, they had to take it to the Philistines. So there were only two swords in all of Israel. And they belonged to King Saul and Prince Jonathan. And Jonathan laid that sword at the feet of the shepherd boy. He gave it away in an act of sacrifice and really submission. And, and this picture of removing what makes me special and giving it to someone else, that is so kingdom lowering myself to the position of a servant and raising someone else up, giving them honor and dignity and love. That is the church. That is the church. Oh, my goodness. And you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of Jesus. Jesus, on the same night, right before he died, he took off his robe. And he was dressed in the apparel of a slave. Jonathan's standing there. He takes off his robe and his, and his, and his garment. He's in a loincloth. He's in his skivvies, right? 
and he lays that stuff down at his feet. Jesus did the same thing. He took on the appearance of a slave and he bent down and washed his disciples' feet, lowering the God of the universe to a position of servanthood. That is so church. That is what it means to love your brother and love your sister and do it well. And do it well. Jonathan was saying, you are my brother starting today. I am taking you out of the field and I am bringing you into my family. He adopted him as a child of the king, raises him up to a place of honor and dignity while simultaneously lowering himself to the position of a servant. And as the church, we're called to do the same. Romans 12, verse 10 says, Actually, I'm going to start in verse 9, so you have to listen. Verse 9, don't just pretend to love others. I love how that's in the Bible. Don't just pretend to love others. Don't just check it off your list. Don't just say, well, I have to do this. I'm a Christian. I should do this. I don't really want to, but I'm going to. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. And verse 10 says, love each other with genuine, true, unadulterated affection. And take delight in honoring one another. Like, have a competition. Who can honor each other best in spirit and in truth? Lift others up while lowering yourself to the position of a servant. It doesn't matter where you came from. Whether God pulled you from the fields, or he plucked you from the inner city, he plucked you from some sinful situation Once you are adopted as a child of the king, you gain that title of child of God, child of the king, son of the king, daughter of the king, princess, prince. And you get all the rights and all the privileges thereof. And we need to give it to each other, treat each other with that kind of dignity and respect. It's like the the, the kid down the street when you were growing up. His parents worked late. Sometimes they got home at like 8 or 9 p.m. So like at 6 p.m. you get a knock, knock, knock on the door. And you let him in. And you say, hey, Bobby, hey, Joey, here's your seat. We made made dinner for you. You are bringing him into your family. You are taking him out of the dysfunction of the world and bringing him into the devotion of the family. We are devoted to each other. We love each other. We want to support each other. We want to feed each other. You are taking someone out of the miry clay, plucking them out of the fire, but then they are immediately brought into the family. Not We don't just, you know, when, when someone gets saved, we have them say the prayer, that's great, they're saved. But you've got, they're, okay, they're plucked out of the fire. That's not enough. Out of the fire, into the family. Firstborn son status, firstborn daughter status, lift them up. As the church, we bring outsiders into this family and build each other up to a higher level of worth. We bring them in and build them up. That's what it means to love each other as children of the king. And when outsiders see it, okay, there it is. That is the church. Where do I sign up? How can I be a part of this family? That's what we need. Brotherly love. Number two, Jonathan loved David by uniting with him in purpose. They were united. They were as one. Their souls were knitted together. From this point on, David and Jonathan were no longer just thinking about themselves but they were intimately involved in each other's lives. As the church, we are called to be intimately involved in each other's lives. I know when you're sick. I know when you're struggling. I know what your family is going through. I know where you have been and what you are going through now, and we're going to get on it together. We're going to bear each other's burdens in love. That's what it means to be the church. David and Jonathan, they talked about their struggles. 
They comforted one another. They protected each other. They made vows to each other. David would later become the king of Israel, <clears throat> which meant that Jonathan's father was killed and his kingdom was stripped away from, like, from Jonathan's family. Jonathan and Saul were both killed in battle. But David made a promise, made a solemn oath, a pact with Jonathan, that I will protect your family. I will take care of your family, even after you are gone. And so during the, you could think of it like the sacking of the city of Jerusalem. David was not a part of this, but his people thought, I'm going to gain favor with David by killing all of Saul's family, killing all of Jonathan's family, and they went in and they killed everyone. And David wept. He wept for what was lost. But there was one child who was saved, who uh, uh, his nursemaid, he was like, I don't know, two or like a little kid. She carried him out of the city and hid him when she saw what was happening. But in the way out, she tripped and he fell and his legs were crippled. So she saved his life, but he lived as a cripple his, his whole life. The moment David becomes king and he hears that Meshibbeth, or the hears that this boy is, is still alive, he says, bring him in, and I will give him a seat at my table. I will raise him as a prince. <laughs> the same love that was given, Justin, you're such a good, you're such a good kid. <laughs> the same love that was given to David, the same kind of sacrificial love, bringing a shepherd boy into the fold, becoming a king, a prince, a king, was shown to Jonathan's son. He did the same thing. I will give you a seat at my table. I will give you a royal robe. I will make you a prince, and I will treat you well the rest of your life. Brotherly love. Just like David and Jonathan, the church must be united. We must stop thinking of things in terms of what I want, what I need, what kind of church service that I want. But we must be united under a common banner, a common mission. See every person find real hope and renewed life in Jesus if we can rally behind that, if we can be as one, a force moving forward together like an army, there was one order given and we did our job. We followed orders to see every person find real hope and renewed life in Jesus. Can you imagine? No one could stop us. No one could stand in our way. And when we are united in purpose and in mission, do you know what happens? We grow in love. Two soldiers, one from New York, one from California, they would never meet. But they're shipped off to Afghanistan, shipped off overseas, and they fight under a common banner for a common purpose, and they become brothers. They would die for each other. They have each other's backs in thick or thin. And if one is lost, they suffer. May it be like that for the church. May we be so united under that common banner that we would die for each other. And John, it says, and John, it says, there's no greater love than someone who would lay down their life for a friend. And we see that in the book of Acts, the early church, right when the church was starting. Acts 4, verse 32. says, All the believers were united in heart and in mind. Guys, their souls knitted together. 
like David, like Jonathan. They did everything together. Going back to Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says the same thing. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals and to prayer. And a deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all of them, all of the believers, every single one, met together in one place and shared everything. They didn't say, this is mine, this is mine, this is mine. They said, this is ours. Everything was given to this common goal. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple every day. This is a group of over 3,000 people. And the thing is, they didn't know each other. They weren't friends before this. The day of Pentecost, it says that when the disciples were all speaking in tongues, they were speaking in all in completely different languages, and everyone who was visiting heard it in their own language. So the Frenchmen, I don't France probably didn't exist back then. The Frenchmen heard it and heard their message in French. The Englishmen heard it in English. The Arab heard it in Arabic. The same message. So all of these people were from completely different places. They spoke completely different languages. They had completely different skin colors, completely different cultures. They all joined the cause. They were all united under the single banner of Jesus, and it didn't matter their skin color. It didn't matter the language they, they spoke. It didn't matter the culture because they were united and because they loved each other with a desperate intimate, tender love that has never been replicated. May we break that, that, that curse. May we be the church that, that, that can replicate it, that can take it farther, that can love each other with such a deep, affectionate love as that has, that has been given to us by the Father in heaven. Only then will unbelievers look at our church and see, they say, there it is. That is the church. Where do I sign up? It is only when we can live with, in such a world of brotherly love and, and sisterly affection that the love of Christ can be made apparent to the world. Let's do it. I want to do it. When the church is united in purpose and in love, the world takes notice. The world takes notice. Can you imagine it being said of our church? Their souls were knitted together. You read about it, you know, in the, in the history in heaven, there will be a book or something. Hope and Life Church. Their souls were knitted together, like that of David and of Jonathan and like that of the early church. And they gave everything they had, not just time, not just, not just talents, not just treasure. They gave their whole souls up for the kingdom. They gave up their own wants, their ideals, and they said, I'm here for, I'm here for Jesus, and I'm here for you. We're not just 120 people pursuing God individually. We are one church pursuing God in a united front, sharing Jesus with everyone else. I love our church, and I think we can do it. I think we can do it. How many of you want it? How many of you want that? Show such distinct, tender love of God to one another. And you all know how. You all know how. But I'll give you the list. Here it is. Are you ready? I know it's in your somewhere. I can't find it. Here it is. Call your brother. Pray for your sister. Visit them in the hospital. Feed them. Comfort them. Encourage them. Equip them for service. 
disciple them, raise them up, hold them accountable for their sin. Hold them accountable. And above all, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. Jesus said that from the cross. Forgive these people. They have no idea what they're doing. And neither do we. Show them the same love that Christ gave you and watch the world know. Would you all stand to your feet? I'm going to ask you for a commitment today. How many of you, with every head bowed, every eye closed, are willing to commit to seek out and to give out the same kind of brotherly and sisterly love that we see portrayed in Scripture? How many are willing to commit to love your brother, love your sister in the same way that Jesus loved you? And that includes dying for them. Raise your hand. There is no greater love than he who would give up his life for a friend, for a brother, for a sister. Let me pray for you. Jesus, we come into your presence by your blood, by the power of your blood, Jesus. And Lord, we see what we should be doing. We know what we should be doing. We know this great love that you have given us. It must be shared with each other. So Lord, fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your love, for God is love. Fill us with your presence, with you, that we may know how to love each other better. And hold us accountable, God, when we fail. Jesus. Raise up our church. Raise up our church in a united front to bring real hope and renewed life to the world. See every person find Jesus and be invited into your great family, a family of devotion, not dysfunction. Help us and bless every single person who strives for this, who works for this, and call us to greater heights. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we don't end any message without giving an invitation to join this family. It is an open invitation. As I said before, it is a plucking you out of the fire and pulling you into the family. Every, every eye closed still. Is there anyone in this room or online who say, I want to be a part of that family. I want to put my faith in Jesus today. Please raise your hand. I see that hand. And if you're online, God sees you. God sees your hand. Raise it to him. Well, how do you do that? How do you join the family? Jesus says you turn from your sins. Say, I don't want to live that way anymore and you turn to Jesus, and you let him lead your life, let him be your Lord, your Savior, and your guide. That's it. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and with, um, with everyone, who, everyone in here joining who is a Christian, would we just all pray this prayer together? Say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. I don't want to live that way anymore. I turn to you, Jesus, and make you Lord of my life. Save me, Jesus. And God, I will follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer, the answer is always, 100% of the time, yes. You are a member of the family. You have a place at the table. Knock on the door at any time. Amen. Let's love each other and love each other well. God bless. Great job, Pastor Christian. Thank you. And if you just raised your hand to put your faith in Jesus, I really want to encourage you to stop by the following Jesus table in the lobby. 
and we we have a, a, a free course that we are providing for you to help you grow in your relationship with Jesus, and we have a free swag bag. Now, I love something you said today, uh, Pastor Christian, that we bring them in and build them up. We bring them in. Can we say that together? We bring them in and build them up. So knowing that one of the most powerful things you can do is invite someone into the family of God, who in your life could you give a personal invitation to for the church? Who could you invite that is not part of a church that could be part of this loving community? Just think about that for a second. Who could you invite? And let's invite them. Amen? Amen. That's good. I love it. Uh, if there are a, uh, two or three people that could just help with a little bit of setup right after the service for tonight, I invite you to do so, and I'll, I'll just meet with you. And I think... I think that's it. So, oh, connect cards, that's it. If you have a connect card, be sure to drop them in the back box. God bless you, everybody. Thanks for being here today. We'll see you next week. See you or, or tonight. See you tonight.